Hey, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in this, uh, this planet today. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, this is, I think, I, I don't know, I counted it was like our eighth or ninth cockroach hour that we've done, all various different topics. And today we're going to be talking about, I, I just, I, it's CDC and ETC just because it sounded really good, but we're going to talk about change data capture and how uh, really a database, while great as a system of record or a general purpose database, um, often it, it cannot live alone um, and, and it's got to work with other things and integration with the tools and the systems around you uh, is, is really important. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, we take pride in here at Cockroach is, yeah, we're, we're building a, a world-class database, but we want to make sure it works the way that you work uh, and works with the tools that, that, you're, that you're working with. Um, you know, it's a big, big day for us here. Uh, you know, if there's the, the Twitter sphere is talking about, you know, the Forbes Cloud 100 um, you know, we're honored to be on that today. I think we were ranked number 60, which is great and, and exciting. And I hope, you know, for all you all out there that, that use us, um, yeah, ho hopefully meaningful to you too, because we are, you know, trying to push really hard into being, you know, this kind of next generation cloud. But, you know, what's interesting is there's lots of other tools on there too. Um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about Snowflake today. Uh, and I think Snowflake is ranked number one on the Forbes 100 list. So, you know, how do you have a, clo a cloud data warehouse and a cloud OLTP relational data store work together? And hey, here we are, change data capture um, today. So I just wanted to congratulate my friends at Snowflake. And I, while I'm here, I might as well congratulate all my friends and Dave McJanet over at HashiCorp for getting uh, listed on that. So uh, a quick bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, there is chat, there's QA. Um, as with all of these sessions, if you've joined us before, uh, we are definitely engaged in the chat. You know, our team is here. I think some of our, our team members are actually um, on the chat as well. I see a couple of us, Artem and a couple others. They may help answer your questions as well. Probably know a whole lot more than I do, that's for sure. Um, but they'll answer there and we'll try to uh, filter those questions into um, our panelists as well. Um, QA or chat is totally fine. And, and the recording of these will absolutely be available as always. Um, our team does a great job of getting them up on our um, on our YouTube channel uh, very quickly and then post it on our website as well. So lots of different ways you can access this information. So before I get the question, is this being recorded or not? Absolutely. So um, with that, let's uh, let's bring on our, our guests. So um, again, hi, everybody. I'm Jim Walker. I, uh, I'm product marketing here at, at Cockroach Labs. Um, today's session is on CDC and change data capture. <clears throat> um, you know, Tim and I were talking about this yesterday. And, uh, you know, I think both of us are, you know, we have light expertise while we bought in an expert in Chris. Chris has a much deeper expertise. We figured the, the general consensus or the average across all three of us was we're, we're really weighing down the topic here, Tim. And so I kind of called it beginner. But we're going to talk about CDC, some reference architectures of how you use this to integrate with other systems. Um, you know, how do you use it with S3 buckets? Are you streaming the Kafka? How do you integrate with a data warehouse, right? Like, CDC is one of these features that we built and, and, and is allowing people to do that. So we're going to talk about that in the context of, of CockroachDB. So uh, one last point and one last bit of housekeeping. Uh, JP is on, the, is on with us today as well. He's in there as, a, as the Cockroach Labs thing. Um, but you know, for great questions, we will definitely be sending out mugs. They're real. So I finally got one. Thank you, JP, for sending me one. I don't know if Tim's gotten his yet, but... Yeah, I don't have a mug. What kind of... Yeah, kind of operations sorry. JP running here because you've been on these plenty of times with me. So I guess you got to be nice. You got to ask good questions. So please do ask good questions, and we'll ship these out to you. They come in a nice box. So um, all right. So uh, Tim, welcome. Can you just uh, 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 introduce yourself and what's your role at Cockroach? Yeah. Hey everybody, Tim Vale. I uh, head up the sales engineering team here at Cockroach. I, you know, my computer's down here, my camera's up here, so I'm going to be looking awkwardly at both places throughout the thing. I also just noticed that, you know, as I said in previous calls, we've been moving. Um, the kids' playroom is right behind me, and I see my wife like bringing boxes down to unpack them. So uh, who knows what will happen in the background? Maybe I'll turn video off if it gets too crazy. But glad to be here. Glad to be talking about CDC, and really thankful to have. Uh, Chris with us, who uh, who has some experience with CDC. So um, good to be here. Looking forward to it. And Chris? Hey, folks. Chris Cassano. I've been on a couple webinars. You might have met me before. If not, great to meet you. I have to say, because Tim is here, that I work on Tim's team, but my job is really to work for you. So as you have questions for CDC or other things related to CockroachDB, feel free to throw them my way. 
Does anybody work for Tim other than Tim working for, hopefully we sell like a, like a little mermaid show in the background later today. During yeah, I don't know what's back you know, there's, a giant, there's a giant Olaf stuffed animal, Olaf from <laughs> the movie Frozen. I don't know if that's, that's visible. I, I really need to do a better job here. But oh. anyway, it's not about the background. It's about CDC, Jim. Yeah, and that's what we're here. After. And my first place, White Sox. So that's my only personal thing. Um, this is a little bit of a, 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 an area of interest for me. My, my background is also data integration and data quality and master data management. And you know these concepts of being able to move data from a database into the right place so you can actually deal with that data in a way that you want to, um, you know, really critical for every one of our customers. I mean, both you know, across you know, the, the smallest of startups to the largest of enterprise, you know, use the right tool for the right job. And I think that's what CDC allows us to do. I think you know. I I think about it more as a, as as the right conduit to 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 the systems that we have in in place. So, let's just start at the very top level. And I'm gonna. I'll, I'll, this is the easiest question, so I'll float it to Tim first. What is CDC, Tim? What does it stand for? What is it? What is it used for in general? Yeah, change data capture uh, is certainly what CDC stands for. Um, and we'll get into all the details. So I won't say too much here, but um, you know, for us, it, it's a lot like what you described, Jim. It, it's implemented by something called change feed. Uh, that's the actual you know, keyword that we use to enable. But what it really does is it allows data to flow rather seamlessly out of Cockroach into something else so that it can be consumed by a wide variety of tools. Um, and as I think we'll get into, that simple act or this simple feature really unlocks a lot of really interesting architectures so that right. you can uh, do a lot more with the critical data, operational data that's stored in your Cockroach database. Uh, but for us, it's, it's really, you know, getting data out into something else is, right. is what this does. And there's a little bit of a history here too in terms of what we did here. I think, right, Chris, we were talking and this wasn't something that we were like, oh my God, we got to build this thing, right? It kind of evolved over time, right? Do you, do you have any insight into the history of how it ended up in CockroachDB? Yeah, one of our engineers uh, came up with the idea and built a prototype and you know uh, thought that this would be a great feature. And turns out there's been a lot of uh, customers and, and folks out there in the wild that are have been consuming it and want to use it. So we've put more rigor behind it. We've added more features. Uh, we have, uh, you know, an engineering team that we're building around it. So it's something that we've, uh, you know, we've adopted that kind of came out of a, you know, kind of a fresh idea. And um, because of the usage and so forth that the customers want with it, that we've, you know, we're maturing it more and more. So right. yeah, and I think there's a, there's a pretty good blog post that I have up here written by Dan Harrison. Um, this is over a year ago now. And so we've come a long way with, with CDC as a feature too, right, Chris? I mean, from the early days, like, like Tim said, I think it was just built off of change feed, right? Um, but it's, it's, it's matured a fair amount, right? Yeah, and I, I've, uh, there's a couple of customers I've worked with in particular where they wanted things like just even having compression. You know, you're sending a feed out to another sink or another source. That just being able to compress that data makes it, you know, makes the, the, the stream smaller and um, easier to work with. So. Yeah, working with customers is what we do to figure out how we can make these things better. Um, obviously, you know, folks want to be able to support multiple syncs that are out there. Yeah. Um, you know, we there is an HTTP sync, so even if we don't have um, something that's specific to, um, you know, your sync, you can always use HTTP to, you know, basically route the data there and then figure out what you want to do with it. Um, yeah. From you know, from that endpoint. I have two sinks in my house. It's a bathroom and a kitchen. I. Sorry, dad joke, excuse me. But I think it's a good way to think about it though. I, I love the name actually, cause it's like, how do you drop it into a repository? Uh, how does that just accept that? And there's all different types and each one of them is kind of gonna speak their own language, right Chris? And so like, it's, it's a game of like building up the right things but having something generic enough so you can take something from Cockroach and it. So, so Tim and I don't know which point of you to ask actually, but you talked about something called a change feed. Is a change feed just something standard that's in a database? Remember, this is a beginner question, right? Let's go, I, I, we, Tim, I, Chris, I'll go Chris. He's, <laughs> he, look at him, he looks happy to answer. Sure, so yeah, when you create a change feed, you're essentially creating a job on the database. And that job is really to sit there on the ranges of you know, a particular table that you pick and it's going to sit there looking at all the events that are happening on the range, and then it's going to uh, send those events out. 
Um, and you can give the frequency of how often you want that to, um, to sync to the source um, right. or to resolve to the source. So, you know, if you're going to cloud storage, it might be something more like 10 seconds. But if you're going to Kafka, maybe, you know, about a second or so right. uh, where you want to get those events out. So yeah, it's, 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 it sits as a job on the database and um, you can have it work on one table or multiple tables. And is it, is it configurable to how often it's actually looking at the data and, and, and collecting changes and publishing that out? Yeah, so it's, it's constantly grabbing all the events and then you just give it the time of when you want to flush it out. We call that okay. a, a resolve, uh, the time it takes to resolve. So right. like I said, that re resolve can be about 10 seconds, can be a five right. minutes. Um, you can kind of, uh, you, you can configure it based on what your need is. Yeah, and I think, you know, just really quickly, a quick clarification. I know you talk about ranges. I think we all talk about ranges for Cockroach Labs because, well, we live in ranges and that's how we think about it. You know, in Cockroach DB, the way that data actually gets stored is in these chunks of data, which we call a range, and that's what we replicate. And we use Raft. And actually, next week, we're going to have the uh, an architecture of a distributed SQL database. I'm going to get into that next week. We're going we're gonna to run that one again. And there's been some updates to our architecture. So we're gonna talk through that. So if anybody is interested in understanding what ranges are and how we actually work, you can think about it as a group of rows of data basically is, is really what a range is. So it'll monitor a, a, a range of data basically and, and take care of that. So often, you know, you guys, I don't know, I'm an older database person, I guess. I don't, I don't look older, but you know, Tim does. Um, so in terms of, you know, this, this, this sounds a lot like triggers to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think triggers can be conditional on certain things happen. You know, is this, is this similar? And is this kind of like one of those areas that, that people use this for? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, yeah, triggers are kind of an interesting beast. Um, and it, it's one that a lot of OLTP systems, uh, kind of legacy systems certainly implement and provide it is as many folks on this call know if you don't I'll, I'll i'll say it again you know cockroach implements the postgres wire protocol so for all practical purposes is postgres compatible uh, but when we say that there are usually a couple caveats that we give and one of them is we don't support triggers in the traditional sense and why do people right. use triggers well there's lots of good reasons to use triggers or certainly have been good reasons to use triggers in the past but the idea is some operation occurs on a database and you want to tell, uh, tell the system that when this happens, do some event, you know, do something. Uh, audit logging, for example, is often um, implemented with triggers or had been in the past. So at Cockroach, although we are Postgres wire compatible, as I said, triggers is one thing we elected not to implement uh, in terms of the, the, the syntax of a Postgres. But what we did do is, or what many of our customers do do, is implement um, trigger-like functionality with right. CDC. And so, um, you know, we can go a little bit into why, but again, the kind of the, the, the concepts are very much the same. What, what the change feed does or what CDC DC does is it listens for events on a particular table in which the change feed has been enabled. And when an event occurs, it is fired. Oh, great question. Um, and then, um, you know, whatever system you have listening to that event can, can do other things. And so probably a poor yeah. example, but yeah. Um, Lots of, uh, lots of use cases here. Yeah, you know, Tim, I, I always think, I think of triggers and stored procedures in particular. And look, there's reasons why people do them. I look at them as ways in which uh, big red databases keep you tied to them. Uh, the more you tie capabilities and functionality inside the database, the more you're actually tied to it. Imagine migrating those things into another database. It is just a way, like, let's just, mm -hmm. let's just have data be data. Let's let the database do as minimal as possible. I, I believe that's the, that's the way that I think about these things today. Um, but these composable components and, and, you know, bringing things down to the smallest atomic unit, like I'm a, I, I have fully transitioned into distributed thinking mm -hmm. um, and, and allowing small components to deal with what you want to deal with. And then using those things in the context of CI, CD and GitHub and everything and like, you know, let's architect and abstract these things out into where they should be, as opposed to using this monolithic, put everything in one place, right? Like, yeah. Oh, you're absolutely here. right. And, and, you know, look, CDC, um, is it a perfect replacement? No. Uh, for triggers? No, it's not, right? right. But it, it's exactly what you said, right? Is a, a composable solution. It's a building block that you can, 
leverage, and we'll talk, I think, about some of the kind of creative the ways people are leveraging CDC, but it, it is now something that can that can go well beyond the features and functionality of triggers That's right. because of because we're using kind of common best practice core cloud native distributed building blocks um, that that people can just do some really, really fascinating things on. That's right. That's right. I mean, you know, triggers within a database do make a whole lot of sense. I want to trigger like from this table to this table and these set like totally yeah. get it. And yeah. yes, I get that. We can do some of those things. It's just that we're using change feed a little bit. And look, it's a it's an architectural decision. Do you really want to be start propagating and doing lots of things in a distributed database that's actually across multiple different regions? Well, there's, you know, there's costs associated with that. So like, I think there's trade offs, right? So um, and we'll, we'll, you know, I think we, we have ways of thinking through UDFs and store procedures. And I know the team's thinking through all those things and what, what's efficient and right yeah. in a distributed world, right? So, yeah. And, you know, one thing I wanted to say, it maybe rewinds the clock a little bit, but I, I thought it was interesting. You know, you kind of mentioned some of the historical context for why CDC was created. And I think it goes back to something that we often talk about at Cockroach, which is kind of why are we here? You know, what, what is Cockroach? What are the fundamental problems Cockroach is trying to solve? And, and one of those is clearly, you know, we want to be kind of the world's greatest OLTP engine, right? Versus I think, you know, other kinds of engines, certainly OLAP would be, uh, uh, you know, something else. So when we sat down to kind of build uh, the database, certainly we ran into lots of people who said, boy, it'd be great if we could do this kind of reporting and that kind of reporting and that right. kind of analytical stuff and this kind of analytical stuff. And I think ultimately we kind of sat back and said, you know, we're not looking to build another OLAP engine here on top of Cockroach or alongside of Cockroach. What we would rather invest our time in is really two things. One, continuing down this path of building kind of the world's best OLTP engine, right? But do enable our users to get data out in an efficient way so that they can hydrate other purpose-built right. systems for reporting, OLAP, et cetera. So I think, it, you know, very intentional in this that we wanted to focus our energy on continuing to refine OLTP um, features and functionality, but do provide this mechanism so they can take our best data stored in our kind of best of breed OLTP engine and move it quickly to a best of breed well, OLAP engine. That's right, Tim. And, you know, it was interesting. I was on a, um, a, a similar conversation to this, but much better because I was with Spencer. You guys are great, but you know, um, I'm joking. Chris is smart, but you, I don't, you know, yeah. separate. So Spencer, our CNO, CEO and I were talking about this uh, last week. We were on a webinar with, with Red Hat talking about this. And, you know, if you look at our ultimate, our, our ultimate competitor, in my opinion, has always been the speed of light. Like there's a lot of other databases out there. Like we want to build a transactional database that's fast enough that it actually can do transactions across the globe. And if you're going to do transactions, well, the data's got to be right. So we've kind of turned the dial on speed and consistency. And if you do that, you can get really good at system of record and general purpose database. Can you move towards translatical? Yes, we, we can move in that way. We've done things like vectorized query in the database that allow us to, you know, do some more interesting kind of analytical type queries. Will we be doing implementing cubes and be a multimodal database? Well, I would love to fast forward five years and see where we're at on all that. Um, you know, but if we look at like what we are over the next three to two, you know, that we're a transactional database, correct? I mean, and that's that's really the underlying architecture is built for system of record types. Oh, look, hey, well, there you are, buddy. Yeah. I, I just saw your Slack and you said, look up, Tim. But I yes. can't, I, I'm like looking down to see you and I can't look up. It's too weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now we're just getting a whole different view. Now it's me. just, it's you with I'm a propeller on your head. looking at you. Yeah. It's it weird. looks like a nerd helmet. But yeah, that's, that's why cool. I don't like this view, Jim, but I, I want to make you happy. So let's, so let's, let's continue. Okay. This isn't even fine. So let's move on. So uh, that's kind of the basis of it. There's been a lot of questions. And Chris, thank yeah. you for kind of jumping in and answering questions. So y'all like, thank you. The, the, the engagement is super high again. Love this. Um, how are people using CDC today? Um, you know, I, that, that, should we start there? Should we start with you, Tim, or bring Chris back into this conversation? Uh, we, we could tag team, no problem. All right, uh, go, go for it, Tim. I, Chris, you, you have the most experience with our customers and building out kind of reference architecture on this. Like, what are the patterns you're seeing people use um, change data capture for with us? I've basically seen about three patterns. So um, my first got to Cockroach, uh, one of the first use cases that came up was being able to create an audit trail of everything that's happening on a particular table. So I worked with a customer to, to, to resolve this one. Basically, so 
anytime there was an update that happened on a particular table, insert update delete, they wanted to be able to send that to an archive to say, hey, this is everything that happened. Or, this is how all the data changed on the table. Yeah. We're less concerned about the SQL statements, more concerned about what actually happened with the data. So um, we created a change field on, on those tables. Uh, the, that data then got synced into Kafka, and then Kafka wrote that out into, um, uh, I guess, some type of archival uh, storage area. It might have been Hadoop or something like that, uh, maybe Hive. And uh, that was kind of like the first one I experienced when I was here. And that's come up uh, a few times, especially with in regulated environments. I feel like audit trails are important. So is that kind of like a specialized bin log kind <laughs> of, uh, you know, you know what I mean? Like it's just at a data level, but yeah, it's, it's one way. Exactly. To, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and we have SQL audit logging as well, and that's important for some use cases, but in other use cases where you need to really track data value. This is at, at the data level itself, which is important to actually think through. So totally get it, but it's good stream. And yeah. using Kafka to do stream processing on it. Correct, yeah. And with, uh, with working with that customer too, we were able to actually show the before values of when something was getting changed and the after values of when the event happened. Mm -hmm. so that was a, you know, a feature request that the customer asked us to do, we, we did it. Um, I would say it's the other use cases that come up a bunch. Um, analytics is probably the next biggest one. Mm -hmm. um, so sending data to a Snowflake or Redshift or BigQuery, uh, very common. Like sending data to cloud storage where um, it can be picked up by another, um, another analytical system is probably our, our, probably our most common use case. Uh, and yeah, Jim bringing up a great uh, doc, uh, doc that displays how to do this. And even though this is only showing it for Snowflake, the same pattern you can use for, for BigQuery, for example. So yeah, again, another very common pattern. So really quickly, Chris, while we're here, and I do this every time we get on this call, big shout out to our docs team, best docs in the business. You're all gonna, you're all gonna nod your head and anybody who's actually online who's actually used our docs is gonna say, yeah, they're pretty solid. So um, this is, if you just, search for snowflake in our docs, you're, you're gonna come up with this, but this is, the, this is the pattern, right? This is what you wanna do for really Redshift, any of the, the large kind of data warehousey type things is this, it's all outlined right here, right? Yep, all outlined right there, step-by-step step on, on how to do it. Cool. But that's the one that I'm most familiar with is integration with the, you know, OLTP to OLAP, right? Yep. Exactly, yeah. Cool. I didn't want to interrupt. Yeah. What was the next use case? Oh, and the last one, uh, last one that comes up every now and then is hub and spoke. So being able to take data out of Cockroach and sending it to, you know, maybe a system of access. Um, so that works well because, you know, you, you pick like, uh, you know, a table or a group of tables that you want to logically send somewhere else. Um, so that's a very, another, I would say fairly common pattern. Those are the three I see the most. Yeah. So analytics, audit logging or data logging and, um, Hub and spoke. Right. Have you anybody seen, have you seen anybody kind of try to use it to do replication? Like think about, it. okay, I don't know why somebody would do this. Why would you ever do cluster to cluster asynchronous replication when you already have the date? Like somebody doesn't understand what we do, right? Is, have you seen it try to be used in that way? I don't know, Tim. Well, I think so. It's similar to kind of what I've seen um, and, and called by different names, but like one thing that we often, hear customers inquiring about it and sometimes suggest is using CDC as a mechanism to hydrate, for example, a second um, cockroach cluster. Well, why would you do that? In, in a lot of cases, it could be done for, I want to create a UAT cluster, right? So I've got a production system. I want to stream effectively and efficiently as opposed to kind of doing a backup under store. Um, data to a cluster that I might do some pre-filtering on and use for my UAT environment. So, you know, just as um, just as Snowflake and BigQuery and all these other things can read from a Kafka, you know, you could certainly create an application front end that reads um, from Kafka and, and rehydrates another cluster. So we've seen this kind of, you know, not necessarily for online real-time replication between two clusters, but certainly right. this idea that I'm I'm going to pump data out of one cockroach cluster via CDC into another one to do kind of testing UAT type stuff. The other variation of that, by the way, and we've, we've talked about this quite a bit uh, with various customers is, and, and maybe it sounds contrary to a statement I made earlier, 
But you know, if you think about a cockroach cluster as being a, a, you know, designed and built and, and maybe the schema and the entire cluster topology built around highly transactional workloads, I could use CDC to uh, emit data from that cluster, uh, consume it, and then hydrate another cockroach cluster, which has a slightly different topology, maybe a very different topology or configuration that's designed a little more for you know, heavy read operations. So you know, I don't want to send my operational reporting teams to my online transactional system, I'm going to create another cockroach cluster to do some kind of lightweight mm -hmm. reporting out of there. So it's, you know, lots of, one of the great things I think about CDC, which we're, we're kind of dancing around is that it unlocks lots of really cool architectures. It's almost it's, kind of what you can imagine you can build, especially right. when you're using the Kafka sync, because as we all know, lots and lots of interesting applications can be built off of data that sits in Kafka. And really, you know, what is Cockroach at this point then, but another source of data uh, for Kafka. Right, and, it, and it's the art of the possible, I think, is what we're talking about yeah. here, Tim. And what do you want to dream in terms of your data architecture? And we're not going to mm -hmm. refine you to anything. We're going to give you the tools to do what you... Let's let Cockroach work with everything and work the way that you work, I think, is what we're going to... But this is a really good segue, actually. If we start, like, okay, what is CDC? How are people using it? I think the next question, Chris, is is where can data land, right? Like, we, you know, I think there was a question here about, you know, what kind of syncs do you guys have and all this. And you, you talked a little bit about HTTP as a general thing. Um, you know, what are the options today? And, and you guys, by the way, I feel really bad. I think Piyush is the product manager, right? Uh, no, this sits under uh, Michael Wang. Yeah, I totally messed up. We should have had Michael on here. Forgive me, everybody. We should have had Michael Wang on here. He's the product manager for this, and I totally messed up. But he could have talked about Roadmap, too. But that's too bad. I think you guys have a good sense of what it is. But, but let, let's just get into it a little bit, though. Like, let's go to what, we, what it is and then how it works or how we can configure it. Chris, but like, where can data land today? Yeah, so um, so for the cloud providers, you can go to S3, you can go, go to Google Cloud Storage, you can go to Azure. Um, what's nice about the Amazon S3 interface is that it's, it's in a lot of different products. So uh, we've even tested this internally that you can send, um, you can send data to Minio because that uses the S3 interface. So if you want the, you know, to test the, um, the S3 sync to other storage mechanisms, you can certainly try to do that. Um, I don't know how greatly it would always be supported, but um, it's something you can do. Uh, if we talk about other syncs, so there's also Kafka. Kafka is very popular. Uh, you know, it also works with uh, the Confluent schema registry. So if you have to um, send data in a Avro format and make sure that it's, it's going to be able to connect to the, um, the schema registry to put a schema on top of that particular um, uh, payload of data, you can do that as well within Cockroach. We give you the, um, the config steps to set that up. Uh, and then lastly, uh, there's actually two other ones. So one is the HTTP endpoint. So if you don't have a, you know, a particular sync built, but you have interfaces built in HTTP, so for example, like you know, Elasticsearch or Solar, they have uh, REST API endpoints that um, you can just send the data data to there, right? And they they can pick it up and index it from um, from their their API requests. So that's one thing you can do. Um, and then I would say the last one is if you just want to um, just uh, what do you call it? Um, basically send it to standard out, right? Where you're sending all the records out into standard out and you could show it in a terminal or pick it up from there. So Those I could really just kind of like the four ways. I get to sit there and watch changes and just tail and figure it all out. And yeah, like, it's, it's amazing. Just, I, I, yeah, it's and I think basically the matrix. It's the reverse yes. matrix. Yeah, right? And I think maybe another thing just to kind of point out in this case anybody is wondering, you know, so we're talking about kind of where the data lands, but what is, you know, what is shipped across the wire when change feed is enabled. And so, you know, there are really two options for that. And, and Chris kind of hinted at, at one of them. Certainly, you can configure the message uh, that is, is being transmitted, in effect, to be in Avro format, which is really neat for the reasons Chris described, you know, the fact that it can be pulled directly into schema registry, et cetera, et cetera. And if you don't know what the Avro format is, we can send some links, uh, but really kind of neat stuff. The other, obviously, is JSON. So what we're talking about here, or when we're talking about change feed, you know, regardless of kind of where you're sending it, what are we talking about here? We're talking about JSON messages that represent this event that's occurred on the table where change feed is in, has been enabled. And, and there are a number of different configuration options, probably beyond the scope of this, this call. But um, 
you know, you can control kind of the content and format essentially of, of those messages. And again, you know, we're talking here about, you know, very industry standard stuff. We're not creating our own format, you know, to consume this data or transmit this data. This is kind of very open standard stuff. So if you know how to read JSON, uh, which almost every language has libraries for, it's really, really easy to kind of pick this stuff apart and build unique things with it. Right. And there's some pretty good examples, Tim, right, on how to actually use this. I'm actually going to go into our docs one more time here, um, just while we're talking about that. Let me just, and by the way, guys, I think that the Snowflake IPO came out and it like doubled in price. They're like $260 a share or something. Jesus. Wow. Talk about integrating with a, with a, you know, talk about, you know, wow, that's an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Anybody hasn't seen that today. Um, but in, in our docs, if you just type CDC, you'll, you'll see our whole like uh, overview on change data capture. Mm. Um, and it goes through lots of different ways in, in how you can actually use this. We talked, Tim talked about different types of, of data files, Avro, um, syncing to Kafka, um, even a cloud storage sync, so an S3, something like that. Um, yeah, but it's all actually pretty well outlined in, in these sort of things. So and, and I know we didn't have, you know, scheduled any, anything to show really, but I think, you know, just looking at the kind of the, the, the right-hand navigation there, it reminded me of a couple of things that are important. Um, one is we have a really feature-rich admin UI. So, you know, and not, none of this would be worth very much if you couldn't monitor it and couldn't, um, you know, collect valuable insights uh, about its behavior and operation. And so the admin UI is something I know the Cockroach team is very, very proud of. Um, we exposed a ton of metrics and certainly a ton of metrics that are specific to the change feed operation. So if you have an opportunity to download, you know, one of the, one of the ways in which you can get your hands on this binary and, and take a look at the, the UI and specifically yep. as Jim is showing the change feed UI. The second thing is the jobs infrastructure. And we could probably spend an entire um, kind of talk about our jobs infrastructure, but in effect, what's happening here when a change feed is created is that it is leveraging this jobs infrastructure that we've built, which does a lot of uh, important things for Cockroach. One of them, for example, is schema changes. Uh, and that in and of itself in the UI, and then of course via the command line, have um, have different metrics and details that can be reported on. And so you, you kind of saw the, you know, the ability to create, pause, all this stuff. This is really leveraging, again, kind of these core components that we've built. Um, around the jobs infrastructure. So don't need to spend a whole lot of time on that for the scope of this conversation, but it, it really, it leverages some of kind of the best technology that, that Cockroach has built. Um, yeah, and, it, and again, Tim, it's built on top of basically the, the core capabilities that are in the database mm -hmm. already, right? And so we're just reusing yeah. things and then, yeah, exposing these things to the UI. I think that came, a lot of that came in, I believe the 20.1 release, wasn't it guys? I think we, we started to expose a lot of that in UI, is that correct? Well, I, it, I think so, you know, and I think it's, there's a general theme or there has been in the two years or so that I've been at Cockroach there where we've worked really, really hard on kind of building a very stable core foundation of features and functionality. I think one of the things that we've been doing a lot lately is layering on top of that kind of the appropriate level of observability. That's right. Uh, and troubleshooting tooling. So, you know, um, we kind of work through a lot of the, the core stability features and functions. And now you're starting to see us kind of add and enhance um, some of that observability through additional mm -hmm. metrics, through additional APIs, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of good things happening uh, around um, around exposing details. Yeah, and I, the, the features that have been built. And that's you know, I just I I really love startups, and this is that traditional journey through the maturity of the market, right, Tim? Like, let's get look at we built a database. That's not simple to do. Like, if it was easy, a lot of people might be doing it. Building a distributed database is a wholly other layer. Like literally somebody was asking about Pebble today. Mm -hmm. Like we actually re-architected the storage layer KV mm -hmm. that we're using. Um, and by the way, for that question, I did put the blog post into that. Like, why did we build Pebble? Um, maybe if we have time at the end, maybe we could talk about that. I don't yeah. want to like get off track here, but you know, like there's a lot that we had to do to get this thing right. And really over the past two years, you know, building these kind of core capabilities to make sure it works with all the other systems, you know, from a security point of view, from, yeah, from like integration, um, you know, all the managing and monitoring of a database, like this stuff is all super important. How do you do cost-based optimization? And that, like, yes, and all that stuff is, in, and I think these enterprise-y type features that, that allow you to scale out is super, super important, but we're adding more features all the time. So let, let's, let's get a little bit into the configuration. I'm gonna start like how it works a little bit, Chris. Um, so there was a good question here. It's like, so can we do customizations with CDC? 
Can we replicate based on user, change data time format? Like, can we enforce any logic within Cockroach as opposed to outside of Cockroach? Yeah, there's some things that you can do within the table itself, right? So if you needed to, you know, perhaps get a user ID, like if you created a column in that table that has the user ID that you're capturing somehow, then yeah, then it's going to get admitted in the feed. Um, the same thing with, you know, uh, date time format. So you could create a compute column on that table that formats the, you know, the date into a particular format that you like, and then that gets emitted out into the, um, mm -hmm. into the feed as well. So yeah, there's some things that you can do. There's other times where you really need to do it more on the consumer side. So, you know, writing something off of the Kafka queue that's going to transform the data. Um, sometimes that might be more applicable, but yeah, there's certainly things that you can do within Cockroach by using compute columns um, yep. to kind of, you know, munge the data, if you will, so that you can get things in the proper format. Did this work on temporary tables, Chris? I don't believe so. No? Okay. Um, I don't know the answer. I, 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 I don't was, know the answer was either. What's that, Tim? I don't know the answer either. Yeah. I, I, I don't believe they work. I mean, the, the, um, the temporary tables are for another purpose. Um, I don't know if you really yeah. wanted to have a change it off a temporary table. <laughs> right. I guess I'm just thinking through what you were just saying, like how can you kind of munge a bunch of backend things within Cockroach to actually make this work? It'd be interesting. So um, there was a good question here though. You know, we talked about configuration and like how deep you can go with this. What's the system overhead with change data capture turned on? And like, is there a recommended kind of use of it? Is it does, it, does it weigh the database down at some point? Or I guess, how does it work? I guess it's the bigger question, right? Is it just monitoring and it's not interactive or, or you know, disruptive to the flow or how, did, how does it, you know what I mean? So I guess I'll stop talking now. What's the system okay. overhead? So you can expect about maybe about a 10 to 15% overhead. I think we have that in our docs, but you know, it also depends on what you're doing, right? So, um, you know, if, if there's a, uh, a lot of high volume and there's large records and you're trying to, um, you know, emit these things really quickly, you're putting a lot of, you're putting more strain on the database. Um, but you know, anytime you're going to use CDC or you know any database feature, uh, you know you should always test it, right? You should. Yep. We don't always know exactly what your workload is, so it's good to test your workload at scale, and then we can help you tune from there to figure out what's kind of the, um, you know, the, over, the expected overhead that you would yeah. have by using. Just to clarify, Chris, I, I, the documented expected overhead is actually five to ten percent. Well, five to ten percent. Good. Glad someone reading it. <laughs> I shaved five percent off for you. This is uh, why there's many of us by reading the docs. docs. Exactly. Thanks. See, see the docs. Thanks, Jesse and team. Um, so actually, this is a good good question and related. So let's just say that the target is down for a half hour or some amount of time. Um, is there a limit for timeout? Like, how are things buffered? What what happens with the stream at that point, Chris? Okay. Yeah. Great question. So. Um, so usually the change feed will, will it basically is, is like I said, it's, it's on a range. It's reading the events that are happening on that range. And if you wanted to, you can go back in time and start reading um, from a particular high watermark and start reading those events. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that Cockroach does have a GC window, right? That GC window is, uh, is 25 hours by default. It's tunable. You can make it shorter and larger based on what you're doing. Um, so traditionally, we can only go up to that 25 hour mark, right, and be able to give you the changes. Now I believe we do have something around protected timestamps that will allow you to go a little further back in time. So if you are running a change feed, and um, I might not get this whole uh, example exactly right, but if there's a, a reason why you need to go back in time, um, we'll protect the data from being GC'd so that you can still create the events off of it. Um, I believe we just added something, something along those lines. I'm not an expert in that area, but um, it's something we've customers have asked us for. Cool. Um, let's see here. I think we covered everything that. So I, I have one other question, actually. This was actually my own question. Sorry. Uh oh. I, I already got it. Oh. Here we go. How is it? So you talk about monitoring ranges. I mean, how does it work? Like, what are you looking for? Are you just you're looking at a particular column, a particular value? Like, what does the configuration kind of look like, Chris? Um, it's really looking at the rows, right? So when you're getting in the event, you're not looking at a particular column, you're getting the entire row. Um, 
actually one thing that we don't support today is actually multiple column families. So stay tuned, maybe that will come in the future, but uh, that's why we look at the entire row of what's getting changed and we can create the event off of that. And like I said, we can look at the values before the event or after the event. Um, and one thing I can keep in mind too, is I don't, I, I, I believe we don't always have to um, create the, uh, the feeds off of the leaseholder. I think it can work off of the replicas as well. Um, so that's, that's always a good thing, right? So you don't want to overload your leaseholders. You want to be able to use the other parts of the database right. um, for, uh, for capturing these events. So right. we've done a lot of internal architecture to make sure that this, you know, that's, this scales out, that, um, uh, that it's not, you know, we're not bottlenecking certain replicas of the database. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm not sure. I, I might be kind of. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, the reason I'm asking, yeah. it, it was a little bit of a loaded question. You know, I, I love the fact that we can do online schema changes. You know, when you do schema changes, sometimes you have to do backfill. So you have to be careful yeah. in what you're doing with CDC to make sure that, you know, you aren't creating some huge, massive overload. Uh, you know, like, you know, I think with anything in a database, one little change in one area can cause a big problem somewhere else. So when you have these things in place, it, it you know, doing things in production is always tricky. And so you got to be really careful with that sort of stuff. I guess that's where I was kind of going with it, Chris. Well, and the other thing I was going to add here, uh, and then I want to tackle some uh, Husman. Uh, Hus uh, Husam? Husam, anyway. yeah. Husam. Yep, yep. Sorry if I'm, I'm butchering that. Um, we'll answer some of your questions. Cause I think you're asking really good ones. Coffee mug type questions there, I'm yes, saying. Yes, JP. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, kind of what are we emitting? I, this comes up a lot, and we haven't talked about it really on this call, but we've certainly talked about it in other places, is, you know, CockroachDB is fundamentally a database that, uh, that believes in serializable isolation in terms of um, um, the I in ACID and, and all that that means and entails. So one of the things that, to keep in mind about change feeds for us is what are we emitting? Well, we are emitting events. What are those events? This was a question that was asked. Well, think about them as changes to the underlying table, right? I mean, if it's an alter statement, I'm adding a column, I'm removing a column, thus the schema change conversation, or more importantly, I'm inserting data, I'm deleting data, I'm updating data. So an event really represents, you know, some DML operation against a table. Uh, but given our, our view of isolation and given how we implement transactions, et cetera, et cetera, which is, a, of course, a whole other conversation, one of the things you can be guaranteed is what will be emitted in the change feed is this, you know, consistent state of the, the database, only transactions that have been fully committed as per the serializable guarantees that we implement. So you're not going to get, you know, partially baked data, you know, the kind of anomalous behavior that can... Um, that can happen under weaker levels of isolation. We make sure that that what is emitted are these, uh, you know, these committed, complete transactions. Um, and so I think hopefully that clarifies kind of what is meant by an event, right? I mean, it's hey, I've I've written an insert, I've written an update, I've written a delete, right. and um, and you want that change um, replicated via CDC. Um, which, which, by the way, kind of flows into perhaps another question, which is, you know, hey, I got tons and tons of tables. Is there a way to automate the, the script and build process? You know, really, again, what we're talking about here, as is the case with most things in, in Cockroach, is that you implement this feature as an application developer or a database operator via alter statements. So, um, you know, you're going to alter a table to add this change feed, um, in which case it would be, you know, implemented. Uh, so in terms of how do I script this for tables? Well, it'd be as simple as, you know, looking at the, the, uh, the tables that you have in your um, inspecting the database metadata to understand the tables that you have selectively or not applying an alter statement based on a table. So pretty easy to automate um, the creation of change feeds. Uh, one thing I don't think we've specifically called out just while we're talking about uh, change feeds, specifically thinking about top, uh, Kafka in this case, is that when you create a change feed on a table, what you are in effect doing is a topic um, in, the, in Kafka's world. So these change feeds are implemented as kind of a topic per table, um, which is nice uh, in a lot of ways. So if you had 100 tables, for example, you'd have a hunt and you had implemented or wanted to back change feeds with Kafka, you'd have 100 topics representing a table each. Cool. Um, so I, I, I got to keep going with, I, we should have just had Hussam on the call, Tim, because he's asking really good questions. He is. So I hope he likes coffee. There's a longer one here, but um, 
Are you guys looking about this question about migration transforming from legacy RDBMS to, to Cockroach? Yes. Um, so yes, there there are cases where so, you can so Chris, can you just uh, can you paraphrase the question so that it makes sense basically? Yeah, so um, what's the best way to explain this? So anytime you're gonna do a, a like I read it quickly a few minutes ago, so hopefully I got it all to to keep me honest here. So when you're gonna do a migration from one database to another, so say you're going to Oracle to Cockroach, uh, especially when you're doing a live migration, you have to be able to, to move with live data, right? So if you have transactions happening in Oracle, uh, you want to make sure they get over to Cockroach. Right. In some cases, you might want to have Cockroach be able to see back. Well, at that cutover point, you got to make sure everything's clean, yeah. Yeah, so you have to make sure the data is flowing back in uh, two ways. So the question was really around, can you use CDC to help you through this? And the answer is absolutely, right? So, That's interesting. Yeah, so this is one way that you can help help yourself do a cutover um, is by being able to use CDC to, to send these events out. And can you actually map data? It, I, how does it work? I guess, I'm so, you guys, I worked at Talon for a long time. There was a component called TMAP, which allowed you to go from one database to the other. You map data from one thing to the other. What if the schemas are out of sync between the two databases, Chris? Do you have to have something in between to basically map back and forth? Or are you doing that within the configuration itself? Yeah, the, um, we don't have anything today to modify. To, yeah, to modify the schema on the target, right? You're going to have to know right. um, to, you know, to, if there's a new column that comes across, you'll actually see the new column in the change feed. We're going to add a new, you know, a new um, uh, uh, field value pair uh, that will be there in the, in the JSON feed, but your target is not going to be aware that, that that change came across. So you could write a consumer that can look at that record that came through with a new attribute and say, oh, I have a new, you know, a new column. Let me go create an author statement, add the, you know, add the column on your table and, and do it that way. Right. There's nothing that we have automated. You, not, you kind of have to build that yourself. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I just, I guess my friend Karen Dines over at Talent will be really happy that I'm talking about him on a webinar over here. So I'll have to tweet him later and say, hey, go use Talent. It's open source. There's some data integrations. It's, Actually, those tools are still very valid in this world, uh, and using kind of cloud data integration stuff is super, super important because it's all data. And it's all got to work together, right? We're going to give you the tools to make it work with those other things, so that our database will work well in that in that bigger kind of context of all that stuff, right? So, um, cool. I don't. You, I, I, I've tried to read through everything, Tim. Have we answered all the questions? Oh, I don't know if we've answered all of them, but I think we've answered a lot of them, um, yeah. either directly or indirectly. Um, yeah. So there was one about backup and restore. Um, this is very different than that, um, right? I mean, this, you aren't yeah. going to use CDC to do any sort of backup system. It's more, this is much more, when you think about CDC, Chris, it's much more in an operational use case. It's not like a, a management, right? I, like. Yeah, I, I, I don't like using, don't use... CDC for disaster recovery scenarios. Don't use right. it for backup or restore. Don't use it for cluster to cluster, you know, async replication. It's right. not meant for those types of use cases. Right. Use it for analytics. Use it yeah. for audit logging. Use it for some of your hub and spoke architectures. Um, but that's really kind of where yeah. its sweet spot is. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, guys. Um, I, we've, we've hit everything. Uh, you know, we talked for 50 minutes on, on a little small feature in, in Cockroach database, and, but a really super important one, and one that's been around for, for a while. Uh, you know, we've been building out and kind of emerging and, and maturing over the past you know, year, year and a half. So um, I think, you know, kudos to our engineering team for A, adding it, but then all the work that's been done and, and the stuff that Michael's, you know, leading from the roadmap point of view, um, there's a lot of stuff coming with with CDC. It's a, it's a very rich piece of our of our platform, and and honestly, the way in which we integrate with things like Snowflake, um, which I think people are using. So, um, Tim, unless there was anything else you saw in chat, I think we we covered pretty much everything, right? You know, there was a great question out there about Pebble. I know we wanted to wait on that one. So, so you know, Tim, why did we build Pebble? Let me just add, you know, like, like why we're here. Yeah. So yeah, it's a, you know, maybe just a quick, for those of you who are still interested in listening, give you a, a couple more details about Cockroach. Maybe everybody knows, um, you know, this whole thing that we're talking about is a distributed OLTP engine implements Postgres wire protocol. That's all well and good. 
Um, but under the hood, we are in fact a distributed key value store. Uh, that's kind of the, the storage layer uh, underneath uh, Cockroach. From the beginning, Cockroach has leveraged a uh, project called RocksDB uh, that, uh, that I think emerged out of Facebook, uh, a very robust, mature, uh, key value storage engine happens to have been written in C. I did. I did. I used the word robust. Um, written in C. Anyway, it served us very well for a very long time. But the reality is the, um, the, the, the PEB or the, the, the RocksDB code base has grown considerably over time. I think it started around 35,000 lines. It's up around 350,000 lines of code. And it's gone on as it has been implemented by various or used by various companies has gone on to to add a bunch of features we just don't need. Not only that, but it's written in a language which you don't have a ton of in-house expertise in, right? We're a Go shop. CockroachDB, for those of you who don't know, is written in Go. It's not written in C. Um, and so when things went bump in the night, as they have in the past with RocksDB, we wanted a more effective way to triage and troubleshoot instead of poking around code we didn't own. So a lot of this kind of went into this decision to really control our own destiny and build a key value storage engine that works and is purpose built for Cockroach. It doesn't have a bunch of features we don't need. It doesn't not have features we need. It's implemented in a language we know really well. It really gives us back strong control over our destiny because we were getting to a point where troubleshooting, working through issues in, in RocksDB was a bit of a challenge. But right. we are very much inspired by RocksDB and continue yeah. and will continue to contribute. So we are a, um, uh, RocksDB compatible, Pe uh, Pebble will be a fully uh, RocksDB compatible engine, at least for the time being, backward and forward compatible. Uh, it will be uh, released, uh, as the blog announced, uh, GA in our next upcoming release, which is our 20.2 release. It's one we're really excited about. And last comment I'll make is uh, early tests show significant and important performance improvements, not just because we've eliminated the Go C barrier, but because again, we have implemented a storage engine which is purpose built uh, for Cockroach. So it's really, really exciting development in Cockroach. Um, and, you know, who's to say it doesn't ultimately improve um, CDC down the road because of things that we can optimize way down in the guts of the database of the storage layer. So, and it's just, it's, it's really a maturity curve of Cockroach database, Tim, right? Like it's, you know, we, as we've matured and grown over the years, well, we needed to reach down to this layer to extract even further performance optimizations. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what we're doing now without disrupting RocksDB. And honestly, writing it in Go, well, it allows our engineers to actually reach even deeper, um, which yeah. is one of those things. There were a couple questions. I'm sorry, go on, Tim. No, I was just going to give a shout out to Peter, who you know yeah. is, is listed as the author here. You know, Peter, one of the co-founders of CockroachDB was really instrumental along with uh, a number of folks on his team kind of building um, building Pebble. So something built in house, uh, again, kind of spearheaded by one of our founders, Peter. And so uh, just a, well, a really yeah. exciting time and engineering effort from that group. And I hope he talks about Bilal and Jackson and the, oh gosh, I don't, I don't want to start naming people because I'm going to start missing people, but um, a lot of work has gone into Pebble. Um, it is available. The, the repo is, it is open source. The repo yep. is there. It's downloaded. You can use it. Um, there's also, there was a question about Badger and everything else and any of these deeper questions, I'm going to do one thing. I'm just going to refer you to, mm. um, the Hacker News thread. There was a considerable conversation mm. about this and we actually talked about Peter actually answered himself, uh, the differences between this and Badger. It's pretty well laid out here. Somebody was asking that question. Um, but there was a really good conversation, of course, in Hacker News, um, as, you know, as lucky as we are to have some incredible engineers here who are actually sharing with the world, you know, a, a how-to for distributed systems in many ways. Um, each one of these posts does, does, does incur a, a pretty awesome conversation. And, and this one in particular, I think is pretty great. There's 74 comments on it. Um, hey, you know, while you're all here, if, you know, upvote us. We always love that. Uh, this thing did land front page yesterday. So we're really excited about that. So anybody who did upvote us, if you're on, thank you. So um, but thanks to the team, more importantly, and, and the work that Peter Mattis did to spearhead this, um, you know, this has been a, a labor of love, I think is what he called it, a, a long time coming, I think Peter said at the very beginning of this thing. So, um, so it, it's, you know, we're, we're pretty, we're pretty excited it's out there. Um, you know, we are still big fans of Rocks DB, but of course, uh, we got to do stuff within, within the context of, of Cockroach Database, so. 
Um, we're at the top of the hour, guys. So um, thank you. Thanks, Chris, for being the intelligent one. Thanks, Tim, for being here. For No, I'm joking. Thank you, Tim. That was awesome. And um, seriously, it's, it's really, really helpful. We continue to get great feedback because of, um, you know, the knowledge that, that you all have and Tim, especially you, that you bring to this thing because it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, these are not simple things and there's a lot of questions out there. So thank right. you guys for, for doing this with me. It, it, hey, Jim, one, one thing before we go, there was a bunch of questions that came over around Kafka architectures. I will say that it, it's, I was trying to do this in the chat. It just takes too long. <laughs> Um, there's a bunch of different reference architectures out there based on what you're trying to do. If you're using Mirror Maker on the Kafka side or not, or if you have multi-region going to a single Kafka cluster or to multiple Kafka clusters, reach out to us. We can work, work through the reference architecture with you. Awesome. And to Chris, thank you so much, dude. That was uh, that was fantastic. And it was uh, we came on. We did, you know we had some ideas, and it was perfect, buddy. So we got through it. All right, you guys. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Again, I think we have a couple of candidates here for our coffee mug. JP will reach out to you with that. So uh, with that, everybody have a uh, what's today? Wednesday? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody have a great Wednesday. Have a great Wednesday. And, and JP, send me a coffee mug. Come on. Yeah, right. <laughs> thank you all. And Chris, too. And Chris, too. Bye, Bye. everybody. Thank you.